everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Recombinant Cytokines, Aspects to Consider to Supercharge Your Cell Culture. I am Cassie Soltman of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Milton e Biotech. To learn more, visit www.miltonebiotech.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box to the left and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also use the Ask a Question box to let us know if you're having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Anne Kiesebetter, expert for cytokines and cell culture reagents for Milton e. Biotech. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab on the top of the page. Dr. Kiesebetter, you may now begin your presentation. Hello and welcome to our webinar on recombinant cytokines and on aspects to consider to supercharge your cell culture. This is today's agenda. After a short introduction, we will take a closer look at biological activity as this is one of the most important factors when it comes to recombinant cytokines. Afterwards, we will talk about bioassays and how they are calibrated before we dive into the topic of cytokine dosing, where I will show you some strategies and how they can be put into practice to improve your cell culture experiments. And later on, there will be an overview on our products, on our max cytokines, before we close with a short summary and the possibility for you to ask questions. To start off, I would like to take a closer look at some cell culture challenges that everyone working in cell culture has to face in their day-to-day -day lives. And the first one is cost pressure, because we have to stick to a certain budget. And also there's always time pressure, because we want to finish our experiment and the next one is already around the corner. And there's publication pressure. We want to publish our data, find a good journal to accept it. We want to please the reviewers, and that's also pressure put on us. And there's one more uh, challenge that is worse than the others, because it can even amplify them, and that is variability. If results are not reproducible, we have to repeat experiments, spend more time and money on that. We might not get the results we want for our publication, or we do not generate the data in time. And this publication down here is from a few years back, but it's maybe more relevant than ever. The dangers of irreproducibility are becoming increasingly well recognized, and there's growing concern regarding the validity of certain studies. So this is certainly something we don't want and something we want to address. And it would be best if we could go from variability to reproducibility because this could help us save time and save money because we don't have to repeat experiments and do them all over, spend more money and resources on them. And why am I telling you all of this? The reason is that recombinant cytokines play a part in all of these aspects and understanding cytokine activity and calibration and putting these things into practice is key to tackle these challenges. And cytokines, as I said, play a role in all of these, and today we are going to explore how and why. Let's start with some basic facts. Recombinant cytokines are widely used components for cell culture and cell manufacturing, and are used for several different functions, which come from the physiological function of cytokines, of course. They're used for cell activation, for differentiation or for maintenance of pluripotency or cell survival, for example. There are several different expression 
systems for these recombinant proteins. Um, very popular is e, e. coli or yeast cells. There's also uh, hex cells as a human cell line that leads to most natural glycosylation and post-translational modifications. So this is beneficial when using recombinant cytokines on human cells. And also Cho cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells, are very popular, especially for clinical grade cytokines. As they are also mammalian cells, they produce a natural mammalian glycosylation pattern, but at the same time, they provide the species barrier for human pathogenic viruses. And there are some basic specifications to look out for. The first one is purity, the purer the better. We want to avoid any byproducts and host cell material uh, such as endotoxin, which is also a source of variability in cell culture as it can affect cell growth and function and lead to um, cell activation that we don't want. Um, and the most important uh, aspect is biological activity. So this is something I would like to take a closer look at now. For definition, the biological activity or cytokine activity of a cytokine is a measure for its effectiveness in inducing a particular biological response. For example, there can be activation or cell proliferation, and I have put an example down below. Um, here we are inducing dendritic cell differentiation by adding IL-4 and GMCSF to our cell culture. And we can see that on the left side, with cytokines with low activity, we only get low response, while on the right side with high activity, we get more cells that differentiate. So the question is, if both of those are the same cytokines, it's both IL-4 and GMCSF, why is there a difference in the activity? The reason is the production process. The activity of a recombinant cytokine depends on proper protein folding, on phosphorylation, desulfide bridge formation, glycosylation, and proteolytic processing, and all of these factors that need to be on point for a cytokine to properly bind to its receptor and to induce a response. Um, and in this example here, um, I would like to show an example for recombinant protein production in E. coli um, as an expression system. And here many recombinant proteins are expressed as so-called inclusion bodies in the bacterial cells. And those are insoluble aggregates of protein. And um, to actually take these and uh, make a functional protein out of them. They have to be denaturated and uh, subsequently refolded into their natural structure, structure. And during this process, there will always be a certain degree of protein misfolding and reaggregation that leads to inactive protein. And during the production process, it is not possible to keep a constant ratio of active to inactive protein. So there will always be variability in that ratio from production lot to production lot. And this can also lead to lot to lot variations in biological activity. So as you can see in this graph, there can be different ratios of active to inactive protein, which can cause different biological activities for each production batch because of this variation and a certain amount of inactive cytokine that is in this batch. And this is something that uh, just occurs during the production process. It, it, it affects every supplier. And it is something that we need to consider when we use cytokines. And we will get to that later on. Um, because now we have seen that biological activity um, is um, an important factor. We have seen what it is and took a glimpse into the factors influencing that property. And um, we will next take a look at how it is measured. Um, how do we actually know if a cytokine is high or low activity? 
Biological activity is measured in bioassays, and bioassays are cell-based assays, most often performed with cell lines. And what you do is you generate a dose-response curve. So we raise the concentration of cytokines and take a look at the biological effect that induces. And there are different types of bioassays. For example, there can be induction or inhibition of proliferation, induction of differentiation, induction of cytotoxicity or apoptosis, and there are also expression, upregulation, and secretion assays. And here's an example of a dose response curve. So as I said, um, we raise the concentration of cytokine and observe the biological effect. And what you get is this sigmoid um, shape curve. And uh, the question is, how do we go from here to an actual activity value? And there's um, certain things we need to look for for that. Um, the first one is the um, maximum response. So we take a look at the upper plateau of um, this assay. And uh, then we go and find um, the cytokine concentration that induces exactly half of this response. And this is called the ED50, the concentration of our cytokine that is required to induce half maximum response. And in this example here, our concentration to induce 50% of the maximum response is 1,000 picograms per ml. And there is a simple formula to go from here to the biological activity, which is stated as units per milligram. And this is 1 divided by 8050 in nanogram per ml times 10 to the power of 6. So if we follow our example here, and our 8050 is 1 nanogram per ml, so the 1,000 picograms are 1 nanogram, um, we divide 1 um, by 1 nanogram per ml times 10 to the power of 6, and so our activity is 1 times 10 to, the, 10 to the 6 units per milligram. And there is a simple correlation between ED50 and cytokine activity. The higher the ED50, the lower the activity, which makes sense um, if we need to add more cytokine to get the same effect, it is obviously less active. And on the other hand, if we need to add less cytokine because it's more active, we have a lower ED50 and thus higher activity. So we have seen now how bioassays are used to determine a cytokine's biological activity. And next we will take a closer look at bioassays and how they are calibrated. The truth is bioassays used to determine cytokine activity only provide relative values. That means these values are not comparable between different assays because sometimes there's more than one type of assay available to test a cytokine's biological activity. Um, it is not comparable between different labs performing the exact same assay. And also, it's not comparable between same assays performed in the same lab on different days. So you may ask yourself, what is activity measurement good for if we cannot use the values to compare anything? The good news is there is a solution, and this is calibration. Bioassays can be calibrated to become comparable. And this is done with internationally recognized standard substances that can be obtained um, by the WHO or the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. And um, I will show you in more detail how we can go from high variability to low variability and comparability um, in a calibrated bioassay. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we need 
the reference substances or the international standards for that and they can be used to introduce a correction factor um, to correct the results of our bioassays. And um, bioassays that are then calibrated become comparable between different days and different labs performing the same assay. So in our example here, we want to measure the activity of IL-2 and we have obtained the international standard with a defined activity of 1 times 10 to the power of 6 international units per milligram. And what we do to calibrate our bioassay is that we subject this standard, standard um, substance um, to our bioassay and measure the results. And in our example here, our measured activity is 1 times 10 to the power of 5. So we only measure 10% of the correct activity of the activity of the standard. And our assumption um, from this is that the activity of the test item, so the IL-2 that we produce and that we want to test the activity of, is also underestimated by the same ratio. So in this example, it's 90%. So here we can apply a correction factor to correct for the underestimation um, and in this example it is 10 and we can apply this correction factor and multiply the measured activity of our test item um, by 10 and obtain the calibrated measurement of 2.5 times 10 to the power of 7 international units per milligram. So we have seen how bioassays are calibrated with the international standards, but let's take a closer look at the reagents that are available for calibration. The WHO international standards are manufactured and tested according to the WHO guidelines. And if an international standard was used for calibration, you will find the activity given in IU in international units. If these standards were used, cytokine activities are comparable between all cytokines with the same calibration. So you can compare between different suppliers and different batches if you are going to compare commercial products. The same is true for the international reference reagents. These have not been as extensively studied and tested as the international standards, but they are still the uh, go-to option to calibrate and to achieve high comparability. Um, there are also internal standards that can only be used to compare different batches of the same supplier. And of course, no calibration means no comparability. Um, you will find that everything except for the international standard is given in units and there's no possibility to convert international units to units or vice versa as international units just states that the international standard was used for calibration. So if you're going to compare products, how can you find out if the product you're looking at has been calibrated? You can check your data sheet or certificate of analysis because the international standards come with a number code. Um, this is an example for IL-2. And in your data sheet, you will find the NIBSC code uh, marked down here and also the activity given in international units. And this is how you can uh, compare and find out if the bioassay has been calibrated. So, so far we have seen what biological activity is and how bioassays are calibrated. And next up we will take a look at cytokine dosing, how you can actually make use of biological activity in your cell culture experiments. The first question that will come to your mind when it comes to cytokine dosing is how do I determine the right amount? And you can see another dose response curve here. And if for your specific application, 
you don't know yet what the correct amount of cytokine would be, I would recommend to do exactly that, to do a titration and see which cytokine amount would uh, land up in the plateau phase of the assay. And it would be best if that's well into the plateau phase as indicated by the green arrow here, because here the assay is in saturation. If we add more cytokine, we will not get a higher response. And anything less, um, as indicated by the yellow arrows and the red arrow, would be a critical amount as it's not really in saturation or insufficient amount. And there would be a lot of variability um, here um, if you um, apply these insufficient amounts. So, um, this is the way to go if you don't know the exact best concentration yet. Um, most of you will also already have an a cell culture protocol, and most of them, they contain weight-based cytokine concentrations in nanogram per ml. And uh, we will take a closer look at that and see why this can be problematic. So just imagine that there are three different batches of cytokines, batch A, batch B, and batch C. And they're all the same size. They're all 10 micrograms of IL-2, um, but they have different activity. And you might not even be aware of that. This is why I have put the values in gray. And if you now follow a weight-based uh, protocol and your protocol tells you to add 0.3 nanograms per ml of cell culture medium, you will end up with very different amounts of active cytokines that is added into your medium. The amount of um, active cytokine varies between production batches. We have seen that before. And um, so the amount of active cytokine in our cell culture is unknown although the amount of protein is exactly the same. But our responses depend on the amount of active and correctly folded protein and not just total protein. So in this case, our results are not reproducible. And with weight-based cytokine dosing, there are two scenarios that can happen. The first scenario is underdosing. So if you apply all of these different batches, batch A, B, and C, you will land at very different spots in your dose response curve, but all of them are not in saturation. And this leads to a lot of variability between batch A and batch C. You will see very different responses. And um, if you repeat your experiments with a new batch, um, again, the result will be different to the one you received before. The second scenario is overdosing. So if you're following a weight-based protocol and feel like there are no variations, no matter how often you change the cytokine batch, your assay might be in oversaturation. Um, as mentioned before, in the saturated phase of the assay, uh, more cytokine will not give you more response. So there's lower variability in this phase of the assay and adding excessive amounts of cytokines can of course um, prevent variations. But at the same time, this is very cost intensive. Uh, remember that this is log scale and you could use 10 times less reagent to get the same effect. And it can also harm the cells and affect your experimental outcomes. There's growing evidence that artificially high cytokine concentrations in oversaturated experiments can be harmful to cells, and also that cytokine concentrations in cell culture influence the cell fate. So we also want cytokine levels to be constant to um, observe a consistent cell phenotype. And you can see in this nice picture here, Ms. Naronica is struggling with oversaturation. There's a nice analogy between cytokines and chili peppers. 
because too much of them is just unbearable and very uncomfortable for yourself because there's a fine line between just right and too spicy. To sum this up, we have seen that weight-based cytokine dosing can introduce variations as the amount of active cytokine varies between production lots. And so if the same amount of cytokine in nanogram is added to the culture, this can lead to variations as there's different amounts of active cytokine and active cytokine is what actually does the job. So. Um, Adding excessive amounts of cytokines to avoid these variations is also not a good option because it can waste reagent, it can be harmful to your cells, affect your experimental outcomes. And um, a far better option that I would like to show you is activity-based dosing in units per ml. It avoids the oversaturation. You can um, put exactly uh, the amount of cytokine that you need, which saves reagents. And you can also increase comparability and reproducibility as it completely avoids these lot-to-lot -lot variations as we dose by units and not by protein weight. So coming back to our three cytokine batches with different activities, uh, with weight-based cytokine dosing, we would run into problems, but with activity-based cytokine dosing, we can apply exactly the same amount for all of these three batches. We can avoid variations uh, and have the same concentration of cytokine in each experiment, also if uh, we switch to a different batch. And so this is how lot-to-lot -lot variations are overcome with activity-based cytokine dosing. And this is what I would recommend uh, you to switch to. To put activity-based cytokine dosing into practice, it would be best to know the cytokine activity. But most commercial product documentation only states the minimal activity. You will find uh, values like uh, this down here greater than a certain value. And using this as a basis for your cytokine dosing is not a good option. Um, you might be thinking, well, okay, this is the minimal activity. It will be very close to the actual activity, but the minimal activity is nothing more than a QC release specification. And the actual activity values can deviate a whole lot from these values. And this is shown here. So for batch A, you might be good to go using the minimal activity for cytokine dosing. But for batch B and C, uh, you would be way off. And also, there can be a lot of variation from batch to batch that you don't see and that might go unnoticed if you go by the minimal activity. So if only the minimal activity is known, a titration is a straightforward solution. So here you can just start um, a titration with the minimal activity and work your way up and see where um, the response actually reaches the plateau phase and thus determine the correct amount of cytokine that you would need to add in your experiment. If you now feel like you want to switch to activity-based cytokine dosing, there's a possibility to convert a weight-based protocol. And this is done with a simple formula. So your new protocol concentration in units or international units per ml will be the biological activity times the protocol concentration in nanograms per ml divided by one times 10 to the power of six. And we have also um, an example down below for IL-2, if our activity is 5 times 10 to the power of 6 and our protocol concentration is 0.3 nanogram per ml, then uh, our new protocol concentration is 1.5 international units per ml. 
And if you want to know more on the topic and have a nice explanation, more example how, how you can calculate, um, then please take a look at our How to Switch to Optimal Activity-Based Cytokine Dosing app note that you can access with the QR, QR code here. And with that, we leave the topic of cytokine dosing. And next, I would like to show you an overview on our max cytokines and cell culture reagents. So our cytokines and growth factors are part of our extensive max cell culture portfolio that also comprises media, cell stimulation reagents, small molecules, and so on. And they are all designed to support whole experimental workflows and to work well together. They are also standardized and quality controlled to give reproducible and reliable results. And they are available in up to max GMP grade to support translational projects and clinical applications. Our max cytokines come in three different quality grades, premium grade, research grade, and max GMP grade. Our premium grade cytokines come with lot specific cytokine activity. That means we measure and provide the cytokine activity for each production lot that we release. Purities for these products are in general above 97%. They come with low endotoxin and our bioassays are calibrated to the international standards whenever available. Our research-grade cytokines offer attractive pricing. They come with minimal cytokine activities. Um, purities are above 95%. They also come with low endotoxin. And our max GMP cytokines come with, of course, um, lot specific activity, um, calibrated bioassays, lot specific protein content. We check for identity, host cell DNA, host cell protein. They are also sterile and come with extensive documentation and regulatory support. I would like to take a closer look with you at our premium grade cytokines as with these products. We measure and provide the lot specific cytokine activity for each lot that we release. So you can directly go to your certificate of analysis, take the cytokine activity value from there and directly use it for cytokine dosing in your next experiment. There's no additional calculation. There's no testing on your part, which is the great advantage of our premium grade cytokines. So with our premium grade cytokines, you can trust in calibrated cytokine activities as our bioassays have been calibrated to the international standards whenever available. You can also skip tedious in-house activity testing as the testing has already been done on our part. So if you were to test cytokine activity yourself, you would have to spend several days to take cells and culture grow them a bit until you start the tit titration and you would additionally spend some reagent on that process and uh, time for evaluation as well. So you can save that time and money and directly start your experiments using our cytokines. Also our premium grade cytokines support activity-based cytokine dosing um, and as we've seen today, this can increase cell culture reproducibility, comparability, and you can additionally save time and money by not having to repeat experiments and by not having to overdose cytokines. One additional aspect I would like to mention is that with our premium grade cytokines, you can go from bench to bedside as our cytokines allow seamless translation from research use only to max GMP products, as they have a consistent expression system, consistent expression clone, and consistent production process under different regulations. And of course, for max GMP cytokines, there's a lot more QC and documentation. 
And if you're curious to learn more about translational aspects, I would like to encourage you to join our second webinar from bench to bedside, what to consider when translating to clinical grade cytokines. In this webinar, we will take a closer look at clinical grade cytokines, at product specifications and QC assays. So if you're working on a translational or clinical project involving cytokines, uh, it's a great opportunity to learn how you can move your project forward. So coming back to our agenda, we are almost at the end of the webinar. And as a short summary, we have seen today that cytokine activity is not a constant value. It can vary between production lots, also, bioassays used to measure cytokine activity only provide relative values. They need to be calibrated with international standards to be comparable between different production lots and between different suppliers that you might want to compare. Also, we've seen that activity-based cytokine dosing is a far better option because it can help you cut reagent expenses and costs. It can increase reproducibility and comparability of your experiments, and it can also keep your cells happy. And uh, coming back to the cell culture challenges we've seen at the beginning, cytokines all play into them. They might not be the most important factor, but certainly one that you might have not been aware of beforehand. So used and dosed correctly, they can help you increase reproducibility. They can help you get successful publications. They can alleviate your time and cost pressure. And also our cytokines um, help you in translational projects and to meet our, all the regulatory requirements. Please also acknowledge our disclaimer. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time today and for your attention. And now you will have time to ask questions. And if anything comes to your mind later on, please visit our website. Thank you, Dr. Kiesewetter, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just type your question into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for today. Let's go ahead and get started here. Our first question is, do you develop your own bioassays in-house or do you use commercially available bioassays? Um, so there are canonical bioassays that are published in the literature. And when we go and develop a new product, um, we take that as a gold standard and we then establish and optimize that assay in-house. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question that we have here, do you find an increased demand for CGMP cytokines for use in T-cell therapy manufacturing? Uh, yes, of course. So the cell therapy market is increasing uh, with more and more um, applications and indications. And as our company also specializes in this field, we, of course, see a growing demand for these cytokines. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Our next question that we have here says, I'm using cytokines that have a constant activity for each batch. Why would it be an advantage to have a different activity for each batch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what um, might have been confused here is um, the minimal activity, which is basically a release specification um, or a typical activity that is a mean value calculated over several lots. Uh, and this, these are some values that manufacturers provide in their documentation but they don't represent the actual activity um, for a set batch. Um, because yeah, we've, we've seen that the activity varies between lots and this is the case for uh, all manufacturers and suppliers. Of course, you can be lucky and 
um, <laughs> reach the same value twice. Um, but yeah, this is not an advantage, uh, but rather a given fact um, that you would have to deal with. But um, yeah, I also agree that it can be confusing, uh, minimal activity, typical activity, a lot of specific activity. Uh, there's there's a lot of different different terms, um, but yeah, a lot specific one is the one that you would need to go with and um, that is best suited for activity-based dosing. And every other value would have to be um, followed by a titration to actually um, put uh, the dosing then into practice. Okay, great. Thank you. We have another question here. If the activity changes with every lot, then do I have to do the titration you suggested for every new lot? Mm -hmm. That's that's a good question, actually. So in theory, in theory, yes, you would have to do the titration for every new lot. So this is basically also our rationale for providing the lot specific activity uh, to value the work. Um, but we are of course aware that recommendations and what is actually done uh, may differ. So maybe we're not sparing you anything because you would not do the testing uh, for every lot uh, whatsoever. Um, but still the lot specific activity is valuable information that you can benefit from and you don't have to spend additional time on that and extra work. And it can really help you in the long run and create the exact same culture conditions every time. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. We have another question here. This one is a two part question. The examples presented seem a bit extreme. How much does activity actually vary between lots and aren't variations controlled for by QC? Ah, yeah. So that's also um, interesting to look at because of course um, we have selected examples here that nicely show and demonstrate the problems with uh, weight-based dosing um, and how much the activity actually varies is different from cytokine to cytokine. And um, based on our experience, it can be somewhere between uh, twofold and eightfold, can even be higher in some cases, but I would say that the median uh, is around fivefold. So this is definitely something that can cause variations and uh, yeah, should be cared for. Um, I'm coming to the QC specification part. Um, yeah, in general, the specifications are minimal activities. Um, so you will find that for most manufacturers and suppliers that they give a minimal specification and you just have to reach a certain activity value um, to um, pass QC, but there's no upper limit or no range that is defined uh, for QC release. And of course, if the processes are stable, there will naturally, naturally be a range in which the activity will be in. But uh, yeah, as I said, this really depends on the cytokine and uh, cannot really be predicted. And yeah, this is how QC control generally, generally looks like. Wonderful. And as a reminder, if you want to ask any questions during our live Q&A session with Dr. Kessefeder here, please submit them in the Ask a Question box located in the lower left corner of your screen. Our next question that we have here says, we have established a working protocol for our T cell expansion using NGML, and we have very few problems with variability since we titrated the optimal NG amount. The concentration used in the literature was too low. You said that using a higher concentration is not optimal, but it works well for us. Could you comment on this? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a bit of a more complex question um, because whether you observe any problems with variability would certainly depend on your application and also the, the cytokine you are using. Um, as I said, also the variations can be different from cytokine to cytokine. 
Um, but the T cell expansion that is uh, given here is actually a nice example um, because I believe um, you mentioned a T cell expansion uh, process or experiment. So, uh, for example, if that would involve IL 2, um, it has been shown that here the doses um, of IL 2 are really critical because high doses can push the cells towards an effective phenotype, while lower doses you will generate uh, less differentiated uh, memory T cells. And uh, so that can be critical depending on the application. And for example, if you're looking at uh, CAR T applications, you would want uh, the memory T cells because they're critical for the anti tumor efficiency and uh, also show better in vivo proliferation and survival and all these kinds of things. Uh, so this is certainly a more extreme example here, but um, in, in general, I think it's worthwhile to really take a look at your uh, specific assay um, and do the titration, take a closer look, see which cytokine you're adding and which phenotype that generates what your readout is um, to get the most of your most out of your experiment. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Looks like we have a couple more questions that have come in here. Our next one that we have says, we are testing the activity in our own application. Isn't that much better than using an artificial bioassay? Uh, yeah, exactly. That uh, is much better um, because testing in your own application is always the superior way of testing. And we really recommend to do that, to um, take the cytokine, test it in your own application and check all the factors. As I said, if you generate uh, the, the phenotype you want, if, if your readout is uh, what you want it to be. And uh, yeah, of course, we in-house in use uh, bioassays and also, of course, other manufacturers. They're standardized, they're published in the literature, they're performed with cell lines, uh, which causes less variations than uh, primary cells, for example, and thus they give more consistent results. Um, so this is the, the way to go for uh, suppliers and manufacturers to test activity. But of course, we cannot test every possible application. And so this is always something you would try on your own and in your, in your process and in your lab environment. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question that we have here says, based on what you have explained, are cytokines produced in E. coli more susceptible to lot-to-lot -to -lot variations? Uh, that's a bit of a tricky question. I think it refers to the slides um, with the inclusion bodies and the figure with the refolding. Um, so the refolding, of course, is one of the downsides of um, E. coli processes, um, but there are also many advantages because, in general, the pro processes are quite robust. We have um, high yield. Um, it's relatively inexpensive to produce. Um, and um, yeah, coming back to the question, of um, is it more susceptible to um, variation, it would really depend on the cytokine and what factors uh, determine it, its activity. Um, if it's the folding and the structure only, then certainly there may be downsides in the E. coli process. They don't have to be, um, but sometimes um, it's also um, the case that activity may really depend on the glycosylation. And if it, if that's not 100% correct, you can also get variations in a mammalian system. Um, because, yeah, the mammalian systems, you will, of course, produce um, proper, you will proper produce proper fold, folding, you will not run in as many uh, problems uh, folding wise. But um, yeah, as I said, there can be other other issues. So it would very much depend again uh, on the cytokines and um, 
yeah, to really judge it, what is better. I think it's not only the activity, you have to look at the whole picture. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it's, I think it's very difficult to go in uh, detail now, but I hope that uh, kind of answers the questions and gives an idea that, um, yeah, not, not one is better than the other. other. There are certainly some advantages, some disadvantages, and it really depends on what you want to achieve. Wonderful. And it looks like we just have one more question here in our queue. And that question is, it seems that titrations for dosing by activity are also time consuming and require reagents. Can you explain the process in a little more detail? Uh, yeah, so that's actually a good good catch because yeah, that's 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 correct. Uh, performing the titrations would, um, of course, require a bit more time and reagents, but it's certainly worth it. And I would really recommend to do that before you start a new protocol and um, before you start working on something new to really um assess where's your maximum response where's the um kind of cytokine dose i need to reach and this will really benefit you in the long run um but also this titration process it's not um exclusive to dosing by units so it would also be needed if you dose by weight to find the correct dose you would have to titrate it um it just depends on the on on the unit but um, yeah, as, as I said uh, during the presentation, I would really recommend um, to look into unit-based dosing, and we have a lot of material to support you, uh, like the app note um, I mentioned. And um, this is also yeah general information. Um, there's also examples in there when only the minimal activity is known. So it's not um, only uh, suitable when you're using our product, but um, basically for any cytokine uh, you're working with. So yeah, please uh, please take the chance and take a look at that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kiesebetter, do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join today and to submit these um, interesting questions. And yeah, of course, we know that um, compared to all the other webinar content, cytokines might not seem the most exciting one at first glance because they're a bit under the radar. Um, but they're definitely worth taking a closer look at and they can really make your life a bit easier. And I hope that this is kind of a takeaway message. Um, and yeah, again, if you have any questions later on, please take a look at the material on our website. And also, please get in touch if you have any questions later on. Thank you again, Dr. Kiesebetter, for your time today. Uh, we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Milton e. Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, goodbye.